I had to hold the nose of the spindle against the torquing of the jaw bar, which meant that the jaw bar was never properly torqued and the TGS tool would pull out under heavy load. With the spindle lock, I can lock the spindle in place, insert the tool, and properly tighten the jaw bar. The design consists of a ring which mounts onto the spindle inside of the head. It's held in place with a couple of set screws. A pin slides through a main body. The main body is attached to the side of the head and the pin threads into the main body, locking the collar in place and keeping the spindle from turning. The new design eliminates the need to thread the locking pin, simply push it forward into the collar. The new design also adds a plunger switch, which is used to detect when the pin is pushed into the collar, and the plunger switch sends a signal, indicated by the red LED, to Linux CNC, Linux CNC then inhibits the motion of the spindle and the table. If a program is started while the spindle is locked, nothing happens until the spindle is unlocked. The spindle comes up to full speed before the table starts moving. If the spindle would be locked while the program is running, the spindle stops and the motion of the table stops. The first part to be made is the main body, and this will be made in three setups. The hole that's being bored is where the locking pin will slide. After the part is flipped, the new origin will be against the face of the fixed jaw, the parallels, and the contoured side of the part. A gauge block is used to offset the contoured side. I like using the face mill because it removes a lot of material fast and leaves a smooth floor. I'll use it even in a case like this where side milling could be done. I found on the less rigid PM25 that side milling a decent amount of material with a standard end mill, I have a hard time maintaining tolerance on depth. The mill is flexing somewhere and the screw-like forces from the standard end mill are causing me to lose control over the depth. Just a few thousand. This can be worked around with careful control over the amount of material left during roughing for finishing. With insert tooling, I don't notice this problem. Even after roughing, the floor is pretty smooth. Traditional end mills do work well for finishing vertical surfaces. Just keep it a few thousandths off the floor. The third setup is to drill a hole for the plunger switch and start by placing the bottom of the part against a known angle created by angle blocks. This piece will become the collar for the spindle. This facing operation is using a neat feature of the CNC lathe, which is constant surface speed, which changes the RPM of the spindle relative to the cutting diameter. The maximum speed of this spindle is 2500 RPM, and the spindle drive has only a small capacity for absorbing the momentum of the spindle, so the spindle slows down slowly. Close enough. To begin the boring operation, the center is first drilled out. After making a single pass with the boring bar, I'm now measuring the bore, and I'll use that number to touch off the boring bar in Linux CNC.
To drill the four holes in the collar, I use a template glued to the outside of the collar. The brass knobs that come from McMaster are pretty rough, so I just face them to clean them up. The lock and pin is turned from half inch cold rolled to steel rod. This is the first locking pin that I made of the new design and found that I wasn't thinking about the plunger switch right. For a detent I only need a narrow groove. I wanted to learn as much as I could from the prototype so I filled the wide groove with JB Weld, let it cure, and then turned it. This actually worked really well and let me use the prototype to find out what else I didn't know. The position of the detent is important and we can get an exact position by using a transfer punch through the main body onto the pin. The depth of the detent is less important than the preload of the plunger switch. There's a pretty narrow acceptable range and too much pressure and the switch can be damaged. These pictures are from my original spindle lock video and they're just showing how I did layout and modified the head. The spindle collar needs to be positioned so that the locking pin will be square to the head. A little bit of filing might be easier than pulling the spindle back out. Using transfer punches here for marking out screw holes for the main body. I don't have video showing the assembly of the new spindle lock, but I think you get the idea. Like I said earlier, just be careful with setting the preload on the plunger switch. You don't want it so tight that vibration set it off or its life is shortened. This is the hall code that connects the spindle lock to Linux CNC. This is the virtual pin that holds the status of the spindle lock that's attached to the input pin of a debounce component that helps to reduce the noise in the mechanical switch of the spindle lock. The output pin of the debounce component is assigned to the motion spindle inhibit and this connection is given spindle lock signal name. When this signal is high, the spindle is not allowed to move, even though it may have been commanded to move. We only want to set the motion feed inhibit true when the spindle is locked and the program is running. In my hall code, I've already assigned this pin to the run on signal. Both the run on and spindle lock signals are attached to the input pins of an AND2 hull component. Finally, the output pin of the AND2 hull component is assigned to the motion feed inhibit. It's this combination that allows the motion to be stopped by the spindle lock if running code loaded from a file or code from the MDI window, but still allow the pendant to be used. And this is useful for performing origin touch off while the spindle is locked. This code adds an LED panel component to Linux CNC access. The state of the LED is controlled by the spindle locked LED pin. This line connects the logic side to the interface side. And this is the interface side with the spindle lock being toggled. Now with the spindle locked, I'll start the program. And there's no motion until I unlock the spindle. I think a spindle lock should be standard on the PM25, but what do you think? The next video I plan to make is a spindle encoder for the PM25 for doing rigid tapping.